Okay, I will um, I will convene us. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. My name is Sandra Galea, and I have the privilege of serving as dean for the Boston University School of Public Health. On behalf of the school, welcome to this public health conversation on a population health approach stopping suicide. This is part of a symposium which takes place in three parts. Today is the first part. And as I'll tell you at the end, we have uh, two more parts of the symposium on October 8 and October 15. Before I start today, just a few remarks just to frame the, the day. This is part of a series of public health conversations that we hold regularly at this school that really aim to tackle important issues in public health. We are going through a period of time where we have been talking about COVID as a sentinel public health issue really all the time. We as a school see COVID as an enormously important problem, and, but also part of the constellation of health challenges that we face as a population. As a result, we think it's important that we continue discussing the issues that affect the health of populations, many of which actually are affected by COVID. We know that one of the consequences of COVID are the financial and economic consequences of COVID, and we know that those stressors likely are themselves linked to increase in suicide. So part of our goal here today is to continue surfacing important public health issues, referring yes to the moment, but also thinking about how we collectively as an academic and practice community can deal with, deal with and mitigate these issues in coming years. Secondly, suicide is a difficult topic. We realize that. And uh, as we have um, put in all our material advertising this event, if you are thinking about suicide, are worried about a friend or loved one, or you would like emotional support, the Lifeline Network is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week across the United States. We will put contact details in the chat box. Third, I want to thank the um, people who are behind this event. The intellectual architects of this event were our professors in our school, Professors Carol Dolan, Jamie Gradus, Sarah Lipson, and Julia Raifman. Thank you. They have been thinking about this for more than a year. I want to thank the Dean's Office staff who made this happen, particularly Alicia Noel and Meredith Brown. And thank you to all of you. I realize very well that uh, there are many conversations happening in the country right now. We think that the way to improve the health of populations is through gen generating public health conversations so that we can improve that health. Thank you all for being part of that conversation. The format today is we have a moderator who I'll introduce in a second. The moderator will be, will be running the show. We have speakers who will speak for about 10 minutes each, and then we'll have a moderated discussion allowing the audience an opportunity to put in questions through the Q&A so that we can actually engage everybody who is part of the audience. And now I'll introduce the moderator. Uh, we're very fortunate today to have Lynn Jolliker with us. Lynn is a field producer, reporter, and editor at WBUR. As a field producer, she researches and writes host interview segments and feature stories on a vast array of topics for the signature early evening news program, All Things Considered. Lynn has become passionate about reporting on the issues of suicide. In 2015, she produced and reported a 15-part year-long series on the suicide crisis. For anybody who has not watched that, it's really worth um, um, uh, taking a look at. Uh, I think it's outstanding, and that's how I actually got to know about Lynn's interest in the topic. Prior to working at WBUR, Lynn was a television reporter for 18 years, most recently at Boston's WCVB Channel 5. She has covered areas from crime and justice system to politics, medicine, and social issues. I think I'm really delighted that Lynn is with us today. I think she's going to moderate an excellent panel. Lynn, over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Galea, and thank you for inviting me to take part in this important event. And uh, you have set up a, a wonderful panel of speakers today, so let's get right to it. I would love to introduce them. First up, we will have Dr. Amy Barnhorst. She is Vice Chair of Community Psychiatry at UC Davis. Her research interests include public mental health systems, firearms law and mental illness, means restriction as a way to prevent suicide, and teaching medical students and residents about mental illness. Dr. Barnhorst is considered a national expert on the topic of mental health and firearm violence. Dr. Jennifer Stuber will be up next. She is an associate professor at the University of Washington School of Social Work. Her research has focused on health disparities, public health policy, and forms of oppression, including stigma and discrimination. Dr. Stuber co-founded and directs Forefront Suicide Prevention, that's a center of excellence at the University of Washington that's focused on reducing suicide through training, empowerment, and systemic change. Then third, we will hear from Dr. Rita Walker. Dr. Walker is a licensed clinical psychologist and a professor at the University of Houston. Her research focuses on the science of suicide and the mental health of African-American adults. Dr. Walker's work is centered on developing culturally relevant models of mental health and well-being for underserved communities. Then we'll be hearing from Dr. Matt Nock. Dr. Nock is a professor and chair of the Department of Psychology at Harvard University. He directs the Nock Lab, 
where his research is aimed at advancing the understanding of how suicidal behaviors and other forms of self-harm develop, how to predict them, and how to prevent them. And then finally, last but not least, of course, we will hear from BU School of Public Health's own Dr. Sarah Ketchen Lipson. She's an assistant professor in the Department of Health, Law, Policy, and Management. Her research focuses on mental health inequalities in adolescents and young adults, with a focus on college students. Dr. Lipson is co-principal investigator of the Healthy Minds Study. That's the annual survey of college and graduate students' mental health. And she's the associate director of the Healthy Minds Network. So, Dr. Barnhorst, we turn it over to you. Okay, now I've unmuted myself and I'm sharing my screen, so hopefully everybody can see and hear me. Um, thanks for that great introduction. As uh, Lynn said, I'm Amy Barnhorst. I'm at Davis and I work in both the psychiatry and the emergency medicine department. I see patients in the emergency room, in the crisis unit for the county, in the inpatient unit in our county jail and the county inpatient psychiatric hospital, many of whom are there because they are in an involuntary hold for suicidality or self-harm. And in addition, I do some work with uh, teaching and researching suicide and firearms and mental illness and mass shootings and the intersection between all of those things. I have no disclosures to report. Um, and what I'm going to talk about in my opening here is a little bit about the epidemiology of suicide in our country and some of the myths and truths about suicide. And some of the approaches we've taken to prevention and which ones have been effective and which haven't. So we'll start with this question. How big of a public health problem is suicide in the United States? Well, in 2018, there were almost 50,000 deaths by suicide in our country. And that comes out to about a suicide every 11 minutes, just a lot. It's also estimated that for those nearly 50,000 suicides, there were almost a million and a half suicide attempts. And when we think of this in the scheme of deaths, with this pie chart showing in all of the deaths in the United States and the suicide deaths being green, they are big enough to make a significant visual impact, just really roughly looking at how many people die by that versus other means. Maybe most concerningly, it is the second leading cause of death in young, um, young adults and adolescents in the United States. So if you look here from ages 10 to 35, it is the second thing that young people are dying of. But it's not like the raw numbers of those are significantly higher than the raw numbers of suicide in middle age and midlife. In fact, the numbers go up slightly as you get older. It's just that, you know, when you get to be my age, other stuff like neoplasms and heart disease also kill you. So it is a significant contributor to mortality. Also very concerningly, the suicide rates have been rising. Between the years of 1999 and 2016, we saw them go up 30%. This chart shows suicide rates overall and then also broken down by how rural or how urban of an area. So the solid line shows the suicide rates in the United States on average. And you can see that that is also going up. From top to bottom, it's most rural down to most urban. Rural areas have the highest rates of suicide and they also have the highest rate of increase of suicide. So it's gone up over 30% in rural areas and slightly less than that in the most urban areas. There are a lot of myths and common uh, misunderstandings about suicide. And the truth is suicide is a very complex problem, but often it gets still distilled down to this idea that Depression is the single cause of suicide. And if we could just tackle that, we would be done with it. And that it's a medical or psychiatric problem with a medical or a psychiatric solution. If we can just get people to see a physician and get into the care that we have so readily available, we would be able to solve this problem. And also that one of the big issues that is coming up that makes that not happen is that um, people aren't seeking care. They don't have access to care or they have a stigma against seeking that care. And this idea, if only they would seek help, if we could just get them into care, we could stop their suicidal thoughts and prevent an attempt. Also, uh, idea that warning signs for suicide are present and they're easy to spot. We're always told, look out for people, check in with them, you know, keep your eyes out for the warning signs. 
Um, but so let's address some of these myths and how uh, and what the actual truths are. So how much is suicide a psychiatric or medical problem? Well, it turns out if you do have a serious mental illness that you have an increased risk of attempting suicide. And that risk, and this is an odds ratio, which means how more likely are people with a serious mental illness to attempt suicide than the general public. And in this case, they're almost seven times more likely to attempt suicide, not necessarily complete it. But not that many people have a major mental disorder. And we're talking here about, you know, not things like social anxiety or mild depression, but like schizophrenia, serious depression, major depressive disorder, bipolar disorder. So less than half of people who die by suicide actually meet criteria for a major mental disorder or serious psychiatric illness at the time of their suicide. Whether or not that mental disorder is the contributing cause of the suicide, even among the almost 50% who do have one, is a whole other question. Also, it's not just depression that contributes. So this is data compiled from a variety of different studies that looked at lifetime suicide risk. We can see here that in major depressive disorder, the risk is significant. There's about a 3% lifetime risk of suicide. In schizophrenia, it's close to double that. And in bipolar disorder, it's about five times what it is in major depressive disorder. And it's not just in the depressive parts of the bipolar illness that the risk is high. People who are manic, which we often think of as a time where there's a lot of euphoria and you know, inappropriate happiness, frankly, people who are manic are also at high risk of suicide. But there are plenty of other factors that contribute to suicide besides depression or other psychiatric disorders. And one of the big ones is alcohol. So one study looked at people who completed suicide and found that one third of those people tested positive for the presence of alcohol. And that those who use lethal means, including a firearm and also hanging, were more likely to be intoxicated at the time of their death than those who use less lethal methods like cutting or overdose. And this isn't a big surprise, right? Alcohol is a depressant and it's a disinhibitor. So it brings you down and then it takes away your good judgment. So people are much more likely to make attempts when they're heavy drinkers and make serious attempts. Having a firearm around also increases the likelihood of somebody completing suicide. And this isn't because as research has shown, firearm owners are inherently a more suicidal group of people. It's just because so many people cycle in and out of suicidal thoughts and risk factors over the course of their life. But the ones who have a firearm in the home are at a much higher risk of actually making a completed attempt than just an attempt. We talked in the beginning about how for the 50,000 or so suicides we see each year, there's an estimated more than a million attempts. If all of those attempts had been made by a very lethal method, we would have more completed suicides. Just having a firearm in the home, one study showed, increased the odds of somebody completing suicide by more than three times. All other factors, alcohol intake, socioeconomic status, mental illness, all of those being equal. And as Dr. Galeo mentioned early on, suicide and economic stress is related. There's been a number of studies that looked at this. We don't have great data from the COVID epidemic yet because we're still in the midst of it, but this was a study that looked at economic stress following the 2007 Great Recession. And they looked at the three years after that and what was happening with the suicide rates. Now remember, they were already on the rise since 1999, but from 2007 to 2010, you can see that the curve steepened even more and they calculated an excess of almost 5,000 deaths above and beyond what would have been expected had it continued on that rising trajectory. And one interesting study put a lot of these things together. This came out, um, I think, last year. And the Steel Smith Group looked at various counties in the United States and what their suicide rates were. And these three maps of the US show in descending order, the rate between 2008, 2010, 2014 to 2016. And oops, my slide cut off. I think the last one is 2017 to 18. Um, oh, I'm sorry. No, it's earlier than that. Pardon me. It's like 2000 four to six, eight to 10, and then 14 to 16. The cooler colors, the blues and the greens are the lower rates of suicide and the warmer colors going up to the dark red are the higher rates. And you can see that not only overall in the country has the rates of suicide increased significantly, a lot more warm colors and dark red, but that in that particular belt in the Intermountain West and in uh, the rural South and in Alaska, 
the rate has really gotten to be in the dark red. So it's increasing more quickly in those areas. And what they, when they really broke down what factors these areas had in common, we see a lot about the socioeconomic and the cultural factors that influence or related to higher suicide rates. One of the things they found was that areas that had the higher rates and the higher increase in rate had higher deprivation. So they measured deprivation with an index that took into account things like unemployment, poverty, people in public assistance, and lower levels of education. They found also that those areas had lower social capital. And the social capital index took into account things like how many parks did they have? How much open nature space was there? Were there museums and beauty shops in the neighborhoods? Higher levels of social isolation. So more single parents, more renters versus owners, more uh, higher rates of divorce, more people who lived in more isolated areas. Higher gun shops, because again, just the presence and availability of firearms can increase that level. Less access to health insurance and other care. So for those who do need mental health treatment or for treatment for physical health conditions or other health conditions that increase the risk like chronic pain or alcohol use, those resources were not available. And more veterans, because veterans are also at a higher risk of suicide than the general population. So we've, we've piloted a lot of interventions over the course of the decades trying to reduce suicide in our country. And a number of strategies have gone out to, um, to try to intervene, to predict, to prevent, to reduce suicide. Antidepressant treatment is you know, a big one here. One in 10 Americans have taken antidepressants. Um, we have lots of suicide hotlines, text lines, lifelines. There's been enormous waves of physician education and public education, student education, stop stigma campaigns, um, universal screening that's been implemented for depression and suicidality in the primary care setting and the emergency room setting. This was recently mandated by the Joint Commission that accredits hospitals that everybody do this um, and lots of internet and app based supports. And you can see from looking at these that most of them focus on getting people into care. So they're screening a really broad population, basically everybody, um, with the campaigns and the universal screening, and then trying to get them into some kind of care. But unfortunately, none of these strategies have good evidence to show that they reduce actual completed suicides. In the United States, I should add that caveat. Um, one of the things that really has shown promise has been reducing access to lethal means. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that as my last topic and talk about how it relates to the ferry building at the Embarcadero in San Francisco. One of the reasons that reducing people's access to lethal means is important is that surprisingly, there's not this, you know, long uptick of warning signs and behaviors that precede pe most people's suicide attempts. And that is true for a small subset of population but most people who make serious suicide attempts don't spend a lot of time thinking about it. And this study looked at people who had made an attempt that required medical intervention that they considered life-saving. So um, you know, hanging attempt, very serious overdose, some firearm attempts. And they surveyed those people about how long they had been um, planning to do this. And they found that 70% of those folks made that decision to try to end their life in less than one hour. And they actually found that almost a quarter of them had made that decision in less than five minutes. So these are very impulsive attempts. And if they can be aborted, it turns out that most of the people who make them will not go on to die by another suicide attempt. Maybe 10% or so will try again and complete suicide, but 90% of them will reroute their path in life and not go on to die by a suicide attempt. This is because if people have access to a firearm, they are almost guaranteed to complete their suicide attempt, whereas the rate of completion by overdose is less than 10%. Um, so reducing access to lethal means, I think of it as there's all these different ways, you know, to, to get to ending your life or as sort of a metaphor to get into the Embarcadero building. You can come in a car, you can be a pedestrian, you can come by plane, you can take a ferry building to the wharf, you can swim. And imagine that you tried to reach out and stop all of those people in all of those means, by all of those methods, from getting into this final step of the building. Or you could do what is sort of the equivalent of lethal means restriction, which is just lock off the building, stop people from being able to take that last and final fatal step towards ending their life. 
And that's what lethal means restriction does, is it really intervenes at that last point without having to worry about the complicated and obscure pathways that people come to this decision. Yes, we need to do things like fix mental health care in this country, increase access to alcohol and drug services, reduce things like poverty, racism, lack of access to education, um, social isolation. But those are all really big, very problematic long-term fixes. And in the short term, lethal means restriction is one of the few things that has been shown to have an effect. So this is just my last wrap up slide. There are a lot of causes and risk factors besides depression for suicide. And it's largely a societal and social problem, not necessarily, although sometimes a medical and psychiatric one. And the truth is we don't have great pharmacologic treatments. Antidepressants don't seem to have any kind of effect on the overall suicide rate, despite 10% of the population taking them. There's not a lot of warning signs or opportunities for people to intervene, partially because many of the attempts themselves are impulsive and the people doing them don't know necessarily that this is what they're planning to do. So how is their primary care doctor or their partner supposed to see the signs? And many attempts are very impulsive. And this is why uh, lethal means access reduction can have a really solid impact. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, this is an article I wrote about, on this topic for the New York Times about a year ago, if anyone's interested in reading more. And that is the end, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Barnhorst. And next up we have Dr. Jennifer Stuber. Good afternoon, can you see my slide? And hear me okay? Is that a yes, Lynn, can you hear me? Yes, I'm sorry, I had already muted myself. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so good afternoon here from Seattle. I'm very, very happy to be here with you um, all the way over here on the West Coast. Um, as was mentioned, I am a professor at the University of Washington in the School of Social Work. And I actually became a suicidologist. Um, um, it was by choice, but it was not something that I had initially intended. I'm a health services researcher by training. Um, I think it's really important um, when we talk about this topic, and I'm really grateful for Amy's introduction there. Um, there's a lot of big data, a lot of epidemiology kind of thrown at you quickly. And I think it's really important to just to also share stories. These are, these are real people who are actually dying and the consequences on families and communities is like a, are just enormous um, across the country. And I recently heard a statistic that was, was a surprise to me that half of the United States right now um, has been directly impacted by suicide. And so in this case, the story I wanna share it with you is actually sadly my story. Um, and so this is actually a picture of me um, in, in much better shape than I am currently. Um, and my late husband and my two kids, um, Zoe and Jake. And um, the gentleman there, Matt, you see in the middle, the blue shirt, um, the light blue shirt, he actually ended his life in 2011. And a lot of what you heard um, from Amy in terms of what she said around um, risk factors, you know, were really true in this case. So my late, late husband um, was struggling with depression and anxiety and a history of it, but then his depression and anxiety really worsened with a downturn in the economy. It was during the recession that this all happened. And he became much more socially, socially isolated um, because he, as a, he was a corporate attorney at the time, he um, decided to take a leave of absence from work because he was struggling so severely with his anxiety and depression. And so he was very soci socially isolated and then also felt a lot of shame about that decision, you know, being a lawyer, taking time off. He actually said, who wants a lawyer with a broken brain? And then he had easy access to a firearm because it turns out um, they're very easy to purchase. In his, this case, he didn't own it already, um, but he did legally purchase a firearm that he then used to end his life. So this is, this is my story. And this is the story that actually got me into the field of suicidology and really influences the work that I do in this field, including the presentation you're going to hear more about today, which is very much focused on um, lethal means safety and what we can do about that in very concrete ways um, and what we are doing about it in very concrete ways out here in Washington state. So this is a very familiar picture for anyone in the field of suicidology. And I have to say, sorry, let me go back to it. Um, I have to say, 
six months after my uh, my husband died by suicide, I had the privilege of going to the American Association of Suicidology Conference and meeting uh, Dr. Thomas Joyner, whose theory I have put up on the screen. And I have to say, like looking at this theory, uh, probably changed my entire course um, in terms of um, what I do professionally because it was in understanding Dr. Joyner's theory that I actually realized why my husband ended his life. And I realized all that I didn't know as someone who was trained in public health, who was a population health scholar, um, who um, was teaching frontline social workers about mental health policy. And ironically, I knew zilch about su suicide. So it was Dr. Joyner's um, picture, which I'm gonna describe in a minute that really kind of changed my whole professional trajectory. So what does Dr. Joyner say about why people die by suicide? Well, he talks about um, this, this concept of these three different conditions have to coexist simultaneously, that of thwarted belongingness, perceived burdensomeness, and acquired capability. And one's falling into what those three circles um, really is influenced by what we call risk and protective factors, such as mental health disorders and alcohol um, misuse that Amy just talked about, and adverse life events such as, um, you know, being incarcerated or um, getting a divorce, et cetera. So your risks, th those experiences and those risks um, really do influence what happens in terms of those three circles you see there. And so let me just take the example of my late husband. So I mentioned he was a lawyer who a huge part of identity, his, his identity was of being as, as, as a lawyer, was being a lawyer. So when he took that leave of absence, he suddenly was very isolated from his community and, and really didn't feel like he belonged um, or was really worthy. He felt like he was a burden to, to myself and to his family and friends, which of course was not a logical thought. It, nothing could have been further from the truth. But to us, we didn't really understand like what was going on with him. So he was in his mind, he was a perceived burden and then acquired capability. So I mentioned my husband was able to legally purchase a firearm, but really this concept is more com complex than that. And that what acquired capability means is that um, someone has to over time, um, either through exposure to, to death and dying on a regular basis or through exposure to thinking about suicide and practicing it, through suicide attempts and what people call suicide rehearsals or attempts, that they 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 gain the 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 the, the courage in this case. It's really really a scary thing to think about killing yourself, right? And so you gain that courage, and so that acquired capability refers to one's ability to to feel like they can actually take action. Um, so that's a really important theory, and I think really really appropriate to this symposium today that everyone understand that. Um, so as I mentioned, I got into the field of suicide prevention in direct response to learning about this theory. And I think what I've come to learn now for doing this work for the better part of, I guess I've been doing it now for 10 years, is that the biggest challenge we have um, in this field right now is there are enormous systemic barriers um, to being able to really move the needle on this issue. And uh, I one of the things that we've been able to do out in Washington is, you know, Amy mentioned that there's been these widespread uh, healthcare provider training initiatives. We are the only state in the country that requires every healthcare professional to have training in suicide assessment, management and treatment. Um, thousands and thousands of people in the community and in the health healthcare settings have been trained in suicide prevention and it still hasn't moved the needle. And the reason is, is because there are truly big cultural changes that have to take place and big systemic barriers that need to be addressed. And so I'm gonna talk about one of the cultural changes that we're really working on around lethal means safety out in Washington. So um, other big thing I wanna bring up with regard to my education in suicidology is not just Thomas Joyner's theory. I also wanna mention the folks and shout out to the folks at Harvard, Kathy Barber and Matthew Miller, Means Matter. Um, they really educated me very early on that why people die by suicide and understanding that is incredibly important. Obviously those risk and protective fa risk factors and warning signs are critical to identifying people who might need support, but equally important is how people die by suicide. And if we can do something about lethal means, um, then that will make a huge difference at a population health level.
And this, I think this picture is just a really, I'll go through this quickly, a huge summary of kind of, I think what Amy was trying to say in her talk is that, you know, we've got these risk factors, these adverse life events that lead to really that emotional distress, which is those three circles that I talked about related to Thomas Joyner. And then that ultimately can, can goes into a suicide crisis. People can get out of that suicide crisis if they have the right connection to the support they need. They have coping skills, problem solving. Um, it's, it is possible, very possible to prevent suicide. Um, and then if they, the difference can be, do they have time and distance from those means um, that they're considering using in suicide? If they have easy access, their, their, their odds of um, ending their life is gonna be much, much higher. And so, especially if that's a firearm because it's such a lethal mean, type of lethal means that is so lethal. Um, I'm coming at this epidemiologic data a little bit different and that um, we often talk about um, firearms being, being the leading type, leading method used in suicides. And that is true, roughly 50% of all US suicides um, occur with a firearm. But I think this is a statistic that people are less familiar with. So another way to look at these data is to look at it from the standpoint of talking about firearm fatalities in the United States. And most people don't realize, and I know this is true from public um, opinion surveys and other epidemiologic data, most people are not aware that most firearm fatalities in the United States are suicides. And if you look at that band um, that Amy was talking about in the Western mountain states, that those rates of um, uh, suicide being a you know, leading form of firearm fatality are like overwhelming. So like look at Idaho, 87% of firearm fatalities in, Ida, in Idaho are suicides. In my home state, 75% of firearm fatalities are suicides. And so, and yet people don't know this, the population doesn't know this, we don't talk about this. And I can tell you that the firearms owning community where we have a large number of people, um, a disproportionate number of people dying by suicide, they do not know this. And it's largely because of the way we frame this issue in our public discourse. Just a couple more statistics slides before I get into what we're actually doing out here in Washington. Um, so my, my late husband, I mentioned, he passed a legal background check, you know, had to wait 10 days to get that firearm and then picked up the firearm and went and ended his life. So he was a new uh, purchaser. Um, that is not the case for the vast majority of people who um, die by suicide in the US by firearm the vast majority of them are actually longstanding uh, and legal, legal owners of firearms. And so look at this, interval between handgun purchase and firearm suicide, median 11 years. 92% would have passed a background check. Um, and then male su firearm suicide decedents in Utah with concealed firearms permit, 23%. So like what this really demonstrates is that like we've got a problem in the way we currently are even thinking about policies surrounding gun violence if we really want to reduce rates of firearm fatality in the United States because many of the people who are dying from firearm fatality in the United States are they're dying by suicide and they already own guns. They let me just say that again, they already own guns. So we have to figure out strategies to educate people who already own guns um, and not just think about how to keep firearms away from people who maybe shouldn't have them or to, and, uh, for people who have more of a, a gun control agenda, not just um, talk about restricting access um, in terms of purchases, which is not what this conversation here, by the way, is about. It's really actually about the opposite. It's about um, a harm reduction approach, which is language that us in public health, population health like to use, but it's this notion that we really have to do something about changing the conversation up to one of suicide prevention um, in the very large segment of our population of US households that owns firearms. I just wanna point out that we really are in a perfect storm related to COVID and this pandemic in terms of the economic downturn the increasing levels of isolation, um, hopelessness, and then also we have the highest rates of firearms ownership ever in the United States um, during the COVID pandemic. So I don't see this as a foregone conclusion, 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 sorry, I don't see it as a foregone conclusion in any way that we're going to have an increase in suicide rates, but my goodness, we need to get in front of this perfect storm and we need to do it right now. <laughs> 
Okay, so what are we doing out here in Washington? This is a very, very complicated slide, but basically um, we've taken this notion of, okay, how do we change the conversation and bring suicide prevention to the forefront amongst um, communities that own firearms? And frankly, it's not just amongst communities that own firearms. We also have to look at the fact that we talk about lethal means. Yes, um, the leading the leading means that are used in suicide deaths are firearms, but if we looked at firearms and medications together, we would eliminate um, a very large segment of um, uh, suicide attempts, and we would also basically be looking at 70% of all suicides that happen in the United States, firearms or medications are used. And so easy access, not just to firearms, but to medications, is something that we can really work on and help to prevent. Um, and so how many of you, I'm asking on this very, very large phone call, how many of you have unlocked prescription and over-the-counter medications in your home? I'm guessing 90% of you uh, do. <laughs> and that's not a judgment, it's just it's something that we have to look at is that we have easy access to medications that can be lethal to people in your household who may be at risk. So we have to think about not just securing firearms better, but we also have to think about securing our medications better. So um, our safer home, it turns out that kind of messaging actually resonates extremely well with the firearms owning public who really wants to talk about the fact that we have a problem with easy access to lethal means, including firearms. So here's some of the work that we've been doing and we're really guided by a socio-ecological model in our program that's called, that's called Safer Home Suicide Aware. Our programming is led by a very diverse task force of people on both sides of the gun rights issue um, and uh, has huge legislative buy-in. It's a bipartisan issue the way we talk about it out here in the state of Washington. I think the thing we're the most proud about is um, an intervention um, that we've developed called the Safer Brief Intervention, which we're actually deploying at gun shows. We were deploying at gun shows prior to COVID hitting. Um, so who would think that you could be doing a public health intervention in a gun show? Um, we did not think we could do that until we got this kind of collaboration and buy-in um, from a very diverse group of people here in Washington state. So with that brief intervention, we're really out in communities trying to have the conversation way upstream about, hey, look, um, basically educating people about the, this, this issue that most firearm fatalities are suicides and what do they need to do about that um, pro pre proactively. So we, we're doing that. We also have kind of, we're de developing a standardized course um, around, you know, most firearm safety courses, they talk about how to prevent um, accidents with firearms, unintentional um, injuries of firearms and homicide while well, they talk about self-defense. That's what firearms safety courses talk about. We need suicide prevention content in all classes on firearm safety. So we created that course, collateral materials. Um, we're also working very hard at that, that provider level, that healthcare provider level, not just training providers about how to do safety planning intervention, or how to do a lethal means counseling, but it turns out that clinicians are really, really, um, a, not comfortable talking about firearms with many of their patients. So that we're doing some work around cultural competency, around firearms ownership. And again, there's at, at other levels and I won't go into all the details, but we have our own version of a gunshot project um, out here in Washington state, really targeting the firearm safety instructors and the um, firearms retailers and gun shops. And then finally, there's a lot that can be doing at the policy level that doesn't fall into the realm of gun control, which is like the live wire of when conversations tend to break down around suicide prevention and lethal means safety. There's a lot of legislation that can happen um, in particularly looking at how do we allow for temporary storage of lethal means during times of crisis and how do we get the community engaged in ensuring that that occurs. So that's what we're doing out here in Washington. And then my final slide is um, related to our brief intervention that I just mentioned, just because it's gonna be a big story coming out here pretty soon. Our, we have really good data around our safer brief intervention. And you can just see here, what are the steps of our brief intervention? It's about a 20 minute uh, brief intervention, again, happening in gun shows based on using principles of motivational interviewing, really trying to help people understand that when, when we're out there in communities talking to people, people who own firearms, that it's really a conversation about making their homes safer um, because we don't talk about suicide in this country and we need 
need to talk about suicide in this country. And so we have a really cool paper coming out in uh, British Medical Journal's injury prevention based on participants in 1100, 1175 participants who were recruited in gun shows in 2019, just showing that, the, that we actually can have these conversations proactively, even in places like gun shows um, and increase uh, or improve, at least based on self-report, improve storage of medications and firearms. And that's so really critical piece. And what, what we're doing with the safer intervention is we're, we're, as I mentioned, delivering a brief intervention, but we're also distributing locking devices um, for firearms and for medications um, so that people don't have any barriers to taking steps to make their homes safer. So I think that's, I'm out of time, but I just wanted to present a little bit of a stat, snapshot of what we're doing out here in Washington state. And um, I appreciate your time and attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Stuber. And I'm so sorry about the loss that you and your children suffered. Uh, next up, we will be hearing from Dr. Rachel Walker. Dr. Walker? Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for your uh, attention and patience. Thank you all for the invitation. I'm glad to be here. And I'll tell you that I'm actually someone who stumbled into suicide research, to be sure. When I was a doctoral student in clinical psychology, my motivation was more so to understand depression in the African American community. Because when I was an undergraduate student, I just didn't feel like, you know, the day-to-day the -day reality of my community was reflected in my undergraduate textbook. And so I was motivated to uh, pursue a doctoral degree because I thought, you know, I could change things. You know, we all have so many ambitious ideas when we pursue graduate degrees. And I'll say that, um, you know, almost a couple of decades later, we're still trying to figure out some of the same things. You know, as my co-presenters have mentioned, you know, understanding suicide is really very complex. We have some guideposts, but we're, we're still trying to figure some things out. Add to that the complexity, especially in the African-American community, whereby I'm still answering questions of, well, do black people do that? Like, is that a thing in the black community? And what I hope to do today is to kind of shift things a little bit. I, I typically talk a lot about, you know, the balance of risk and protective factors, but I've been thinking more about how to meet the community where the community is. So much that I'm not as much talking about suicide per se, but premature death more broadly. So yes, my, my talk today is diminished reasons for living and health neglect, uh, an alternative approach to understanding suicide in black adults. I did think it was also important to provide just, you know, just some, some pictures to give an illustration to bring to light you know, the lives of actual people who have died by suicide. I think that what happens oftentimes when we hear of children more recently and also adults, you know, those, of us, those of you who watch the show, uh, This Is Us, you know, one of the lead writers for that show is an African-American woman who died by suicide. Um, I don't know if you all can hear this weird feedback that I'm getting, I hope not. And so, you know, we, we think, I think oftentimes, especially in the African-American community, that when someone dies by suicide, that it's, you know, some odd or strange outlier and not something to pay much attention to. And so every time someone dies by suicide, there's this shock and awe, even more so, I think, that's in our mainstream society because of this belief that, well, what it means to be Black is that you cannot die by suicide. And so a number of the statistics end up getting missed. And what I do in my research oftentimes is to peel back the layers and disaggregate the data so that we can see exactly what's going on or as much as possible, see what's going on for African-Americans. It's true that uh, suicide, especially in that 15 to 24 year age group, that suicide is the third leading cause of death. Um, it only follows accidental deaths and homicide. So that's been true for some time in that age group. One of the things that's interesting, because again, there's been a much more attention in the media with, regre with, re um, with regard to child and adolescent suicide, is that we've known for some time now, and based on the same YRBS or youth risk, youth risk behavior data, that African-American young boys are more likely to have medically serious 
suicide attempts than some of his whiter European American counterparts. And that's important with regard to suicide attempts because the medically serious attempts, for those of you who don't know, are those attempts wherein the means was such that if there was not some medical intervention, the child or adolescent would have died. And so those data have been available for some time now, but oftentimes the stats for African-Americans get missed because they're folded in with the larger, the larger group. And I do think it can be important to pay attention for African-Americans because as an example, you know, some of the patterns are different. This um, reference is relatively dated. I don't have any reason though to believe that the data have changed, wherein for younger African-Americans, that's where we see the suicide death rates peak. So for European Americans, suicide more often increases with age. But for African Americans, we see a peak, you know, in that prime time of life at 25 to 44 years old. And that can be important because the risk factors could differ for someone who is, say, 25 compared to someone who is 65 who takes their own life. I also want to highlight, you know, patterns for women and African American women in particular, because when we think about African American suicide, you know, in its totality, and we think about these relatively low rates, um, again, when the data aren't disaggregated, the seemingly low rate for African Americans is driven by the low death rate for African American women. That looks more like two per 100,000 compared to say 14, 16, 20 per 100,000. But again, kind of disaggregating the data and seeing what's going on in there, there was a study about, uh, about 10 years ago that said that when you look at African-American or Black women from age 18 to 24, you still see a relatively high risk for suicide and suicide attempt. And that's important. Many of you know that you know, those individuals who have attempted suicide in the past are more likely to attempt suicide in the future. Um, and I'm getting ahead of myself. I didn't mean to put that slide up just yet. So, even with all of this information, with all of this data, I am oftentimes making the argument, you know, in the community that is, yes, Black people die by suicide. And that's important to me because, you know, when we pay attention to um, who's at risk and those persons who are more likely to get intervention, it has to come from the people around them, especially those in the African American community who are less likely to, you know, see professional, um, to see mental health professionals. And so we have to rely on family members and friends. But if family members and friends are saying, well, black people don't do that, then it's going to be that there's that much more of a mountain, a mountain to overcome with regard to prevention and public health intervention. So what is something that black people do seem to say like, oh, yeah, you know, that's pretty common. It's diabetes. So if you poll 100 African Americans, the overwhelming majority of them know someone who has type 2 diabetes and more importantly, they know someone who's probably not managing their type two diabetes. And so if you'll bear with me just for a moment, I wanna paint this picture for you. That is not only is the, the suicide, prep, um, the type two diabetes prevalence relatively high, but it's going to continue to increase for the next few decades. And so there's an expectation of about two to 300% increase in type two diabetes. That in and of itself is problematic. But add to it that African Americans are twice as likely as European or white Americans to actually manage the diabetes. So management as indicated by HbA1c or A1c that is glycemic control. So you know that your blood sugar is controlled when your A1c is in fact controlled. That's problematic because African Americans also significantly more likely to have diabetes related complications. So blindness, um, losing a limb, you know, all of the complications that go along with being type, diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. Uh, and whether or not someone is African American or not, we know there's a high rate of depression for a person who have chronic illness, including type 2 diabetes. So imagine having an illness that someone has to manage, um, but then also recognizing that oftentimes that depression, and this is true for African Americans, the depression symptoms tend to be more severe. They tend to be more persistent and chronic and just more disabling. And for African-Americans, we also know that there is a significantly less likelihood of getting help for both mental health challenges and for chronic health until there seems to be a crisis. So waiting until there's a serious problem and, and one's life is at stake before trying to get some help or intervention. So imagine adding to that, that diabetes is really very manageable except that if a considerable proportion of people who have type 2 diabetes 
who are asked to you know, manage their diet, remember to eat well, uh, have the energy and motivation to exercise. I don't know about you all, but you know, it's hard for just about anyone to be able to exercise on a regular basis, but add to that chronic illness, add to that depression and what it means to be a depressed person. And it gets to be really very complicated when we think about what we're asking of individuals who are also less likely to get help when they need it. And so one of the things that I have started to think about, um, and we have some data that we work on, it's currently unpublished, but in the context of suicide being as highly stigmatized in the African-American community, so much so that when I ask about reasons for living, I'll have people say to me, well, well, of course, you know, I, I wouldn't even consider suicide. Like we can't even talk about suicide because it just doesn't exist in the community and there's resistance. I do acknowledge that there are generational differences that we do see younger generations of African-Americans more likely to acknowledge, um, more likely to acknowledge suicide vulnerability or that they know someone, but there is still a considerable proportion of African-Americans and black adults who would just deny, just flat out deny that suicide exists or there was something else going on that the information is being missed. It is interesting though, that because of the level of suicidogenic factors, so untreated depression, untreated anxiety, untreated mental health challenges, but also considerable mar marginalization. You know, we talked already about, you know, Joyner's theory in which someone who feels that they don't quite fit in, they could be more vulnerable in the context of desiring suicide and feeling maybe like their life doesn't matter. And one of the things that I have attempted to introduce is, well, what about adding a different um, a different dimension of, in fact, suicide that has diminished reasons, reasons for living. So thinking about, you know, the association be de between depression and diabetes self-care as being a significant association, and the research does bear this out, that people who are more depressed are less likely to manage their depression. One of the things that I wondered about is if those persons also have fewer reasons for living, and many of you are familiar with Marsha Linehan's measure, in which she talks about you know, assessing reasons for living and whether or not someone meets basically a threshold to be able to sustain their own life. And I wonder if we can ask people more about their reasons for living in the context of, of depression and chronic illness, maybe that would help us to be able to better address um, diabetes self-care and also those individuals who maybe just feel like their life doesn't matter anymore for whatever reason. And I'll say more about the reasons for living inventory, especially for those of you who may not be familiar, but reasons for living are those adaptive characteristics that might be diminished in individuals who would otherwise think about suicide. So in a community example, I remember um, African-American, older African-American seniors that we administered the reasons for living questionnaire to, uh, in addition to several other measures. And the measure asks, you know, assuming, you know, so you wouldn't die by suicide. We understand that. We're establishing that you would not die by suicide. So I'm thinking, okay, great, we've established that. What are the reasons that you would not die by suicide? And there were so many participants who approached us to say, but I wouldn't do that. And we said, okay, great, we got that. Tell us why. And they said, but I wouldn't do that. They, they couldn't get their minds around, it doesn't matter why I wouldn't do it. I just wouldn't. Um, and so that was an interesting study for us in that senior population. But one of the things there are six of the things that that measure asked about is the reasons that are falling into multiple domains that include, you know, I just, I believe I'd be able to deal with my circumstances. Like I wouldn't die because I can deal with life or I have a responsibility for my family. I have a responsibility for children. Maybe they have fears about dying, like the pain that's associated with dying. Um, for some people, they think that they would be condemned or they would be socially isolated because someone um, knew that they died by suicide. And finally, because of their spirituality or religiosity, they just say that's, that's morally wrong, that that's not what you're supposed to do. And what we found in this study in which we uh, recruited African-Americans who were either on medication or insulin for type two diabetes, who are between the ages of 30 and 65 years old, um, and, and incidentally, more, than, more often than not, the participants were, were women, um, but there were 211 overall community-based African-Americans in that study. And we asked them about symptoms of depression. We asked them about their distress about having diabetes, because you can imagine you know, having a chronic illness can be upsetting. We asked them about reasons for living. Uh, we asked them about how they cope just in day-to-day -day life. Uh, we also asked them about their perceived ability to be able to do all of the things that were required of them because they had a chronic illness. Um, and then we asked them about their diabetes-related complications. 
Overall, people said that they felt that they were in fact able to manage their diabetes. They felt like they could accomplish all the goals that were necessary for them to take care of their A1C. But when it came to actually engaging in the behavior, uh, easily 35% of those persons who were diagnosed with type 2 diabetes said that they were engaging in regular self-care for that diabetes. So they, they believed they could, they knew they had the ability, that was not a challenge, but were they actually doing what they needed to be doing? And the answer was no. We found that in that sample, depression was about mild to moderate levels. And the depression looked like difficulties with sleep, um, just feeling tired and not having much energy and understandably so, and also having poor eating and appetite. And so poor eating, um, overeating and poor appetite. And so those were the depression symptoms that they most times acknowledge. Interestingly though, because we did find that there was a relationship between depression, having symptoms of depression, having difficulties sleeping and overeating, and that that was related to poor self-care and understandably so. That was only true for those African-American persons diagnosed with type two diabetes who had fewer reasons to live. So for those African-Americans who reported more reasons for live and to sustain their lives, we didn't see an association between the depression and their poor self-care. It, it was non-existent in this particular sample. And so what this research or what this finding is preliminary, and obviously you know, we want to be able to re replicate these kind of data um, in persons who have you know, maybe more severe levels of depression, maybe individuals who also have uh, more chronic uh, difficulties associated with their diabetes. So there's, there's a lot that would need to happen. But what it suggests to me is that if we can pay attention to those persons who have untreated depression. And if we can pay more attention to those individuals who say, I have fewer reasons to live, that we can impact how long their life is sustained. Because for me, I have reframed suicide to what are the slow ways that people die by suicide? It is probably the second most common question that I get when I present in various um, organizations and various settings is, well, are there slow ways that people die by suicide? Because again, there's this speculation about suicide. Well, people don't do that, but maybe they do something else. And so if we can affect change in places where people are more likely to have conversations and diabetes is definitely one of them, then maybe we can at least prolong overall health in areas that aren't real suicide per se. So thank you all so much for your, for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Walker. We have a couple of more uh, speakers. And before that, I just want to remind everybody, if you have a question, please enter it in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and we will get to as many questions as we can at the end. Uh, and next up, we have Dr. Matt Nock. Thanks so much, Lynn, for the introduction. Thanks to our organizers for setting up this event and thanks to you all for tuning in. So as, as mentioned, my name is Matt Nock. I'm a psychologist at Harvard University. And I'm gonna use the time that I have today to talk about uh, narrowing in on one particular area, improving the prediction and prevention of suicidal behavior in among people passing through healthcare settings. And I see that there's an, a fair number of people on and I think we're getting a little tight on time. So I'm going to run through my slides relatively quickly to make sure we leave time for questions at the end. So our prior presenters have talked about the problem of suicide. And so I won't spend a lot of time on um, the epidemiology of this problem. As has been already mentioned, we know that it's the 10th leading cause of death in the US, the second among people ages 10 to 34 years. As a suicide researcher, I would re be remiss if I didn't note that we have made some progress in understanding, predicting, and preventing this problem. We've identified some key risk factors. We've developed some promising interventions, but I would argue that our, our progress has been slow and in many ways, unacceptably stagnant. You needn't take my word for it, as W. Edwards Deming has said, and God we trust all others must bring data. So if we look at the data, I think this is borne out. This is a, a quick figure that shows that over the past 100 years, the rate, the mortality rate for many leading causes of death has dropped precipitously. Just shown here are a few, pneumonia, gastritis, tuberculosis, largely due to advances in science and resulting changes in, in public health policy and in, in clinical practice. This is unfortunately not the case for suicide. 
the suicide rate in 2017 is virtually identical to what it was in 1917. So we haven't made the, the same kind of impact in this area. What I'm gonna argue for is, well, let me take a step back. There's lots of places we need to make change and many of them have been um, nicely described today. I'm gonna to focus on one um, somewhat narrow area and that's the need to focus on healthcare settings. And the reason I'm, I'm making this pitch or this plea is the following. Data have shown consistently that about half of people who die by suicide visit a primary care office in the month before they die. And in the vast majority of cases, when we look back at, at, at hospital records, there was no mention of suicide ideation or suicidal thoughts in the person's record. About 40% of people who die by suicide visited an emergency department in the year before their death. It's a much smaller segment of the population who passes through in ED. So there's a much higher concentration of risk in people in this setting. And we also know that there's a really high risk period that happens right after someone leaves a psychiatric hospitalization. And in the three months after a person leaves an inpatient stay for psychiatric reasons, their suicide rate is increased about a hundred times. So in summary, people who are at risk for suicide are bringing themselves to healthcare settings. In many cases, very shortly before they die by suicide. But unfortunately, we currently don't have the, the means to know who is at risk. How do we identify these folks and how can we best help them? We have though, in the past few years, made some recent advances in large part due to uh, improvements in, in technologies. And I wanna focus on three specific areas uh, very briefly. One is using new methods, we have an uh, improved ability to combine information about known risk factors to better identify those at risk for suicide. Another is with advances in smartphones and wearable biosensors, smartwatches, and so on, we're able to now collect real-time data in a way never before possible to identify not just who's at risk, but when are people at greatest risk. And using digital methods, smartphones, social media platforms, and so on, we're now able to intervene in real time in a way never before possible. So the old traditional model is if we think someone might be at risk, bring them to the hospital, have them go to outpatient treatment once a week, once a month and so on. But we've learned that suicide risk ebbs and flows in between. We really need a way to, to, to be there for a person when they need help. So I'm gonna walk through the, each of these and, and show an example of each of these relatively quickly. The first uh, regards the need for better combining information from known risk factors. So we have identified risk factors for suicide. This is one, a snapshot of uh, the results of a study where the research team looked at risk factors for suicide in every study published over the past 50 years and shown on the vertical axis is the odds ratio. So the increase in the odds of suicide given the presence of this risk factor. You'll see the first bar shows that treatment history is the strongest risk factor for suicide death. Presumably not because treatment kills people but those who are at highest risk are more likely to get themselves in the treatment. After that, these are our next strongest risk factors in order. You'll see they're all pretty equal. They all have the same increase in odds associated with them. The take home here is there's no silver bullet. There's no one risk factor. There's no three risk factors that lead a person to die by suicide. Suicide results from the, 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 the interaction of many different risk factors. Unfortunately, science research really hasn't helped us um, in this regard. The vast majority of studies that have been published look at one risk factor at a time, leaving clinicians uh, without a, a clear way of measuring lots of different risk factors, weighting each one and combining those weights. The human brain just isn't equipped to do that. So as a result, we need to provide methods to clinicians, to society with a way of better identifying people at risk. We've been able to do this uh, with the use of, and the development of electronic health records. So now, you know, it used to be that if you go see your doctor, your doctor will take paper and pencil notes and they'll go into a, a filing cabinet. Now, in many healthcare settings, all of those records are electronic and they sit in databases. So now research teams, and this is a study led by Ron Kessler at Harvard Medical School, are mining those data to see, can we develop machine learning algorithms that look at some of those data, generate an algorithm that tells us who's most at risk for suicide, and then look at another segment of data and see how well that algorithm performs. And in, this, in many cases, people are focusing on this post-hospital period, given that the, the huge increase in the risk of suicide death af after someone leaves a hospital. So what Kessler and colleagues did was look in a sample of over 50,000 hospitalizations, this is among army soldiers, over a six year period, 
And again, in a nutshell, the approach is this. Right when a person comes into the hospital, let's look across their entire medical record, figure out a predicted probability based on their medical record only. This is without talking to a person. A predicted probability that this person's going to die by suicide over the next year. When you do that for all 53,000 hospitalizations and you line up risk factors and you put them in five percentile bins here. So people at the highest risk are on the left most bin labeled one and the lowest risk are on the right most bin labeled 20. What we want to know is the people in the highest risk bins account for the largest number of suicide deaths. And it turns out they do. In fact, the top 5% of people or risk scores capture more than half of all suicide deaths. In addition, about half of people, nearly half of the people in the top 5% bin, if they didn't die by suicide in the next year, they died by accident, they made a suicide attempt, or they were re-hospitalized. Suggesting here that with data already available, with the uh, electronic health record and machine learning methods, we can identify which of our patients are at highest risk for suicide and other negative outcomes. This is done in the Army. A very similar uh, finding was done using slightly different methods in a large um, public healthcare system, the Harvard um, healthcare system. And this approach has been replicated with findings consistently strong across five different healthcare settings around the country, suggesting approaches like this can be generalized. They can operate in lots of different uh, healthcare settings with, with very similar results. I want to transition now to, think, to talking about the need, the, better, the need for better data on imminent risk. From the studies I just told you about, we can identify which people are at risk, but we don't know when they're at risk over this post-hospital period. Is it the next day? Is it three days later? Is it three months later? Fortunately, over the past decade or so, we've all effectively, for better or worse, become cyborgs. And we all now walk around with these digital appendages of smartphones, uh, smartwatches, and so on. An upside of this is this now allows us to capture really fine grain, continuous data on people as they live their lives. Many people uh, tell their phone uh, about how they're thinking, feeling, behaving, sleeping, and so on. And so in a number of studies now, researchers are, are surveying people at risk for suicide several times a day, uh, once a day, depending on the, on the study, asking them about their suicidal thoughts, their desire to kill themselves, their intention to kill themselves, their ability to resist the urge. And I should note, data show pretty clearly asking someone about suicide does not increase their distress and does not increase their risk of suicidal behavior. It is safe to do. We're learning a number of things. We're learning that suicidal thoughts vary pretty dramatically from hour to hour. If you look at the bottom graph here, you see the, each colored line is just one person in this array. You'll see that from hour to hour, people's suicidal thoughts bounce around quite a bit. We also see different um, subtypes of suicidal thinking. If you look at the slide to the right, uh, each different color is a different subtype of suicidal thinking. On the vertical axis is severity of suicidal thoughts. There's a group in green, who, although they, they're thinking about suicide, their thoughts aren't that severe. The group in red near the bottom have consistently high thoughts of suicide, and that so far has been the group at greatest risk of suicide attempts. So by monitoring people's suicidal thoughts over time, we can get better data on who's at risk for suicidal behavior. And in a, in a very recent study, we found that doing monitoring of people's suicidal thoughts during inpatient stay can significantly increase our ability to, to predict who's going to make a suicide attempt after, in the one month after hospital discharge with about 90% accuracy. And our strongest predictor here, interestingly, is uh, dynamic changes in suicidal thinking. So the probability that someone's going to have a huge increase in suicidal thinking uh, from one time point to another which makes sense and helps us perhaps understand a bit why patients are discharged from the hospital still being at risk because we, don't, we haven't yet understood the characteristics of suicidal thinking that might put a person at great risk. I just threw this slide in here during um, a question that I saw in a previous talk. Uh, several speakers have raised the question of what's happening during COVID, are suicidal thoughts increasing? And we've been doing smartphone monitoring studies where we're following people for the six months after they pass through the emergency department. So we've been following people for about a, a year and a half so before, during, and, and you know, currently uh, in the midst of the COVID crisis. And so we wondered if we're looking at patients who we've been following since last year, have, has suicidal thinking increased during the pandemic? This is a slide that shows uh, people's self-report of social isolation. And that vertical line is when COVID was declared a national emergency in the US. 
And so we see huge increases in people's report of social isolation, which correspond with huge increases in the amount of time spent at home uh, by GPS monitor. And we see corresponding increases in suicidal thinking, which is shown in this next figure. And the increases in social isolation predict increases in suicidal thinking. Interestingly, we see this effect in adults, but we haven't seen it in the same way in adolescents. And finally, the, the, the goal here is to use electronic health data, real-time monitoring data to be able to identify people so we can intervene. And I'm out of time, and so I won't say much about this, but over the, there's been a, a, an explosion of smartphone apps to try and help people at risk. Many, the vast majority haven't been tested, but there are a few different apps that we've tested in randomized controlled trials and a few different uh, interventions that have shown an ability to drive down people's risk of, of suicide. So in conclusion, many of those who are at risk for suicide pre present to a healthcare setting before they die. New technologies are helping us to identify people who are at risk. Mobile interventions are helping to drive down this risk. And a real nice advantage of these approaches are they're scalable, they're relatively inexpensive, and they're developing rapidly. Thanks so much to my collaborators and funding sources, and thanks to you all for listening. Thank you, Dr. Nock. And finally, we will hear from Dr. Sarah Ketchin Lipson. Um, great. I'm so thrilled to be here. I'll try to keep my presentation a little bit shorter um, just to leave time for a question and answer since some great uh, questions have been coming in. My research focuses on mental health and suicide risk in college student populations. So just to kind of ground us a little bit in terms of thinking about why college students are a particularly important population. Um, so suicide is the second leading cause of death in college student populations. And as my colleagues have mentioned, um, the second leading cause of death in adolescent and young adult populations writ large. But what really sets college populations apart, I think, is that campus environments um, afford this really unique opportunity for early intervention and prevention during an epidemiologically vulnerable time. There's more than 22 million um, young people who enroll in post-secondary education in the United States. It's a really key time from a developmental perspective. And there's a wealth of human resources that can be leveraged for prevention and early intervention on college campuses. And then lastly, adolescent and young adult mental health and is a really important predictor of essentially every outcome that we care about. Um, so economic outcomes, educational, social, as well as physical health um, in the life course. So the data that I'm gonna share come from the National Healthy Mind Study, which is our annual survey of college student mental health. We've had about 400 campuses and about 350,000 students um, participate in the study to date. Um, so the, our data really point to um, increasing rates of uh, suicide risk. We measure suicidal ideation, uh, suicide attempts um, in the Healthy Mind study. And this is just a graph showing year by year since we began the study in 2007, when 6% of students indicated that they had seriously thought about attempting suicide in the past year. Um, and in 2020, uh, over 14% of students indicated that they had. Many of these risk factors um, have been mentioned previously. Um, so I'll just underscore a couple that might be uh, unique to the college environment. So one is sense of belonging, whether students feel like they are part of the campus community. When students don't feel that, that's a big risk factor for suicidal ideation, um, as is isolation from campus life. Um, discrimination, you can see that among students who experience discrimination, um, the, the proportion who reported uh, suicidal ideation is twice that of students who did not experience discrimination, um, as well as financial stress. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that as it pertains to college students. Um, so as is broadly true, the pandemic has increased uh, financial stress in college student populations, which was already uh, high and, and large. Um, risk factor and student debt, of course, is something that we uh, think a lot about and we know is a really important predictor um, of mental health. So about two thirds of students indicate that the pandemic has made, uh, has increased their financial stress. 
Something that I'm really interested in is the system level drivers of suicide risk and the potentials for intervention at a system or structural level. So this is a graph here where each bar is an institution that's participated in the Healthy Mind study over the years. And you can see that the vast majority of campuses um, that about five to 15% of students on each of the campuses are reporting that they've seriously considered suicide in the past year. But there's also quite a spread, a quite a bit of variation across campuses. And that kind of begs the question of what, what are some of these potentially system level, campus level factors that might be associated with higher levels of suicide risk? Um, so some things are kind of immutable, the campus characteristics, the size of an institution, for example, um, or its geographic location. We actually don't see that many of those factors are, um, you know, highly predictive of variations in suicide risk, uh, with the exception being colleges of art and design that have um, higher rates. Um, you might imagine that schools that are highly academically competitive might have higher rates, and we do not see that in our population level data. Um, so campus characteristics as something that is, you know, not largely, you know, we can't really change that through interventions, whereas there are system level factors that can change that contribute to this variation. And those are kind of the policy environments um, that may affect some of the risk factors that I just briefly touched on. So um, discriminatory policies, policies that don't protect um, for example, transgender and gender nonconforming students on campus. Um, those, those policies shape students' experiences of being misgendered, their experiences of discrimination on campus. Um, and so there's a number of different uh, policies that we might be thinking about as potential risk and protective factors um, for suicide risk. Um, and like I just mentioned, this is a population that I'm particularly interested in is gender minority students on college campuses, which represent about 3% of all college students, but account for about 15% of all suicide attempts. Um, and we've done some research looking at, uh, at this population and much of my ongoing research is focused on understanding the effects of specific campus policies um, that may uniquely affect mental health and suicide risk in this population. We've also seen an increase in rates of mental health service utilization by college students um, on campuses across the country. And you can see in 2007, that about 19% of students had sought services. Um, and more recently, that that's up to over a third of students who are seeking uh, services. However, and kind of paradoxically, there is still this large treatment gap so the majority of students um, who are experiencing mental health problems on college campuses are not seeking help. And about half of students, so 47% of those who report suicidal ideation have not received any form of mental health treatment in the past year. Um, and other research has shown that about 80% of students who died by suicide were never seen in their campus counseling center. One barrier that, um, that, that I don't think has really been touched on, um, and it's kind of complex to think about how we would build an intervention around this, but is lack of perceived need. So many students who report seriously considering suicide still say, I didn't seek help because I, I didn't think I needed it. And I think a reframing of how we talk about kind of the benefits of, of mental health services and when it's appropriate to seek them and, and the many different forms of mental health services is really important in, in trying to address this lack of perceived need. Um, many students who do seek help do so when they're in a crisis, um, which is, you know, of course, a strain on the system and missed opportunities potentially for early intervention and prevention. And that's something that I'm really concerned about and thinking a lot about right now is the fact that um, many students are identified as being at risk for suicide by gatekeepers on campus. And I mentioned, you know, the wealth of human resources. So peers are reaching out to them, as Professor Knox said, you know, asking that question, are you thinking about suicide is, is a, a, an important intervention to make. And peers can do that. Faculty members can do that. And right now in the pandemic, there's just fewer eyes on students and that, um, kind of connection on campus is something that uh, is certainly changed uh, in light of COVID. 60% um, of students uh, in spring of 2020 in the Healthy Minds study indicated that the pandemic has made it more difficult for them to access mental health care. 
Um, and lastly, I just want to say that equity is, is more important than ever. I was thrilled um, to hear Professor Walker's uh, presentation as well. We know that students of color on, on, on average have lower rates of seeking care when they are in need, um, as well as having higher rates of dropping out of college as well. So there's sort of an intersection there around several issues of equity. Um, so there's really an opportunity and urgency for suicide prevention in college populations. There are high and rising rates of suicide risk in this population. Many of the known risk factors may be uniquely impacted by COVID and we'll continue to measure that in the ongoing Healthy Minds study. Um, and we really need to think about system level factors that might be able uh, to, to reduce some of these inequalities that we see. And thank you very much um, to everyone who's on this panel and to BUSPH and all the student participants in Healthy Minds and my wonderful team. Thank you, Dr. Lipson. Uh, so we have a very short time remaining for some questions. So I would love to treat this as kind of a quick lightning round. Um, and one question I want to ask is about means restriction. Dr. Barnhorst, maybe you can answer this um, about the misconception that if you remove uh, one mean, you know, method uh, or means, um, a gun from the home, for example, that oh, the person will just find another way to kill themselves. That's not necessarily the case, right? Right, and we see this not just with guns, but there's been research in a number of other countries with firearms, with um, pesticides, which are a really commonly used method of suicide in countries where there's a lot of agriculture. But if you just take away the most popular means of suicide, that you see an overall decrease in suicide rates, not just a decrease by that means. And a lot of this is tied to the fact that, as uh, Matt said, suicidality ebbs and flows with people, and it's often a very impulsive choice. So it's not what folks think where people are really committed to ending their life and they think about it and plan it for months and years and it's kind of this logical conclusion, it's like a really bad moment. And if they don't have something lethal in that bad moment, chances are they will come out of that bad moment and be okay. Uh, Dr. Walker, I wanted to ask you uh, just real quickly about some of the barriers um, that have existed for so long in terms of people of color, um, the black community, seeking help. I know one of the biggest ones is um, a shortage of providers of color um, and black clinicians um, and a shortage of people with cultural competency in addition to uh, historical experimentation on the black community in medicine and public health and, and other issues. So do you see progress in that area? Um, we hear a lot that one of the reasons some people don't seek help is they don't find someone that can relate to their experiences, including their experiences with racism. Oh, I think you have to unmute. Mm -hmm. I think that the, the progress is a good question. A lot of the progress I think has evolved because of generational beliefs and thinking about seeking mental health and whether or not it's acceptable or not. So I don't know if there's so much a change in the systems that are available. So as an example, there being more access to African-American therapists, which people who are seeking care are more likely to seek out someone who looks like them, looks like them, so that they can avoid microaggressive behavior, you know, and avoid the kinds of things that they're dealing with in day-to-day -day life. And oftentimes, yes, you know, finding a licensed clinical psychologist or finding a licensed practi practitioner who's also providing evidence-based care, you know, the numbers, the, the pipeline is relatively small. So I think that we're seeing change, but it's happening at a glacial pace and probably in part because of just, you know, mainstream television shows that's making therapy more popular and more mainstream and more acceptable. Um, and as you mentioned, Dr. Nock, uh, people have been asking about what's been happening in the pandemic. Of course, research is kind of lacking in that area at this point, but there was a recent CDC report that came out that found people that responded to their survey, 31% of respondents reported anxiety or depression symptoms. I think this was in June. And almost 11% reported having seriously considered suicide. I know BU School of Public Health, um, this school did a study uh, that showed a mo more than threefold increase um, in depression after the pandemic started compared to the last time that same questionnaire was, was done nationally a few years earlier. So this is a question for any of you that want to jump in, Dr. Nock or anyone else. Um, just real quick, what should uh, government systems, public health systems, and uh, medical providers be doing um, and mental health providers to get ahead of this? I mean, really, this has already started and, and it's well underway in terms of the mental health impacts of the pandemic. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. You started with saying, what can government agencies do? I can't help but note that suicide research is 
extremely underfunded. So it's the 10th leading cause of death. If you look at the ninth leading and the 11th leading, you'd have to more than triple the funding for suicide to be just equivalent to those. So there's a lot that we don't know uh, regarding what the right thing to do is. But what we do know is we shouldn't lose our head and we should focus on what we know, uh, exercise, diet, sleep, social connectedness, all have really powerful antidepressant effects and, and we think anti-suicidal effects. So, so stay in touch with people, check in on them and, and engage in a lot of self-care. Uh, do you think we should can I just jump in here on that on um, just really quickly? I think we would be remiss if we didn't say publicly to everybody that uh, it is extraordinarily important to lock up access to lethal means, meds and guns in particular. Leaving a, a gun under the bed or by the bedside table is not locking up your firearm. And the same thing with the medications. Uh, I also think connecting like truly taking time to connect with every member of your family and those people that you're worried about and asking directly about suicide is, is definitely something we should be doing. Um, and being vigilant to the fact that like, this is a really hard time. We have a higher risk. It is not a foregone conclusion that we have to see it increase in rates. Right, I think so many people feel helpless, but that's something that we can all be doing is looking out for those people in our lives that, that we're concerned about. And we don't have to have obvi obvious risk um, I'm sorry, warning signs, right? Sometimes they're there, sometimes they're not so obvious, but we can still ask the questions because it's not going to make someone uh, do that. It's not gonna put the idea in someone's head. Um, so unfortunately we're out of time. Um, this has been wonderful. Thank you to all the panelists. I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Galea um, and just wanted to mention that if, if people have questions, you can reach out to the panelists uh, directly via email. So thank you once again, and Dr. Galea, back to you. Well. Uh Thank you, first of all, Lynn. Thank you for um, for excellent moderation for bringing this panel together. Um, really grateful to um, professors Walker, Stuber, Barnhorst, Lipson, and Nock. I, I, I thought uh, all those presentations were outstanding. I learned a lot from all of them, and uh, I want to thank all the um, audience for uh, really um, some excellent comments, both here in chat. We've had a lot of comments on Facebook, also comments on Twitter. Um, there's been really quite a quite a dynamic conversation going on while this has been happening. Uh, this is. Um, a, it was one of you showed a slide about uh, how we really have not made a dent in uh, suicide for uh, for a long time in sharp contrast with really all other causes of, uh, causes of mortality, um, making this a, a, a truly critical issue. So the fact that uh, there is the scholarship going on, even as it is quite underfunded, is uh, frankly um, something that gives me tremendous hope. And I want to thank all of you for doing that work. I didn't want to just uh, frame what I said in the beginning, that this is actually a symposium. We're splitting it up to three pieces because nobody wants to do a, a full day of, uh, of our webinars. We understand that. And uh, the next uh, date that uh, is coming up for people in the audience is October 8th, where we have um, um, uh, Dr. Devora Castell, who's the World Health Organization Director of Mental Health, and Dr. Josh Gordon, who is Director of National Institutes of Mental Health, doing two keynotes. And then we will follow that up with uh, on October 15, a week later, which is another panel like this one on, um, on the determinants and the prevention of suicide. Once again, thank you to everybody. Thank you to our moderator. Thank you to our speakers. And uh, thank you to everybody in the community who participated in this conversation. Everybody stay well. Have a good evening.